Hey guys, so welcome to my first video, finally, trying to update the YouTube channel. So I posted a, a Q&A like last week and everything and I had a, I have a lot of questions from you guys. So thank you, I got like over 50 and those are all very good questions. So I'll, uh, I can't answer all of them in one session, but I'll try to get to the main thread of them and then I'll post, I'll try to answer uh, as much as I can on the, on the blog and keep this going every week so I can get to uh, a lot of the, all those questions. A lot of those questions are about what to do, uh, sorry, not all, some of those questions are about what to do and that is not exactly what I'm here for. I'm not here to tell you what to do, I'm here to tell you how to do it. Remember, my, I am a humanist at heart. What I want is to better humankind. Telling you what to do will not be, is not the solution. What I want you is to be a smarter coach, a smarter athlete. So I'm going to tell you guys how to do things, not what to do. You, you will see this in general and everything. This is not exactly what I do. There are plenty, plenty of programs out there and very good ones and guys that are very good at those kinds of things. My job is, to, is really to teach how to do things, the why and the how. There's, there's a very good lecture for Simon Sinek on uh, TED that I urge you to go, to go watch. I posted a link on my, on my blog a few, a few weeks back. So to, today I had a, a bunch of questions I really liked. And the first one was, uh, what did my brother taught me? My brother taught me basically that you can push your mind just as much as you can push your body. Okay, and that's something that is very important to me. My brother was a smart one. He had the, the strongest intellect I've, to this day I've ever seen. He's, uh, it's hard to explain how, how smart he was, but, but the thing he showed me really is how far he could push his mind. I mean, and then, so I'm in the business obviously of pushing the body. You guys have seen me outside torturing everybody, but there's, there's more to it than this. This isn't just about pushing the body. It's about pushing the mind also. And so you have to thrive to better your mind just as you thrive to better your body. I'm not talking about memorizing either. Huh? That's, just, that's just one part of it. I want you guys to go out there and become smarter. Push your mind, just not just your body, but push your mind. And this is one of the reasons I use uh, the prowler and all that stuff, because as I talked before about, about pain and everything, I'm, the point is to push intensity as much as you can. Go out there and push the intensity, just go. The, the mind, it will be exactly like how it is for your body. It will be uncomfortable. You will be very frustrated and everything. But if I, if I told you like you're going to be strong in one month, you'd be like, no, that's not going to happen. Most of you by now know that it takes time and it takes work and it's, it's grueling and it's years and years of work and you pay the price and everything. It is the same thing for your mind. You will not wake up tomorrow morning just smart. There's no pill. Unfortunately, that limitless pill not going to happen. You're going to have to put in the work, just like everything else. You're going to have to push your mind into uncomfortable places, into an intensity that you don't want ne necessarily to endure every day. And yes, it's going to be frustrating, just like the rest. It's going to be painful, and it's going to take years of grind. But you will become smarter. It's, it's the same thing. Your, mi your, head will, your mind will be sore from pushing the intensity and everything, but you have to thrive to reach an intensity just as high for your mind as for your body. So, and that is one of the reasons I'm not going to exactly tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you how to do it because I want you out there to apply the principles I'm going to, I'm going to talk about and apply them to yourself, to your, to your athletes, to everybody out there. Just figure it out. Okay. I will give you the stuff that I've, that I've learned for myself over all those years. But after that, you're going to figure it out for yourself and for your athletes. You will become smarter. Okay. So, for example, a lot of the questions were, how do I apply what I do to Olympic weightlifting and not just CrossFit? And that's a very good question. So I talk about the principle of critical mass in the Barbell Shock podcast. If you haven't seen it, please go see it, episode 190 and 191, because you will explain a lot of the stuff. But I will do a, a quick resume here so I can explain where I go from there. So I have a very good analogy for the critical mass. So imagine here we have a shaft, right? big elevator shaft. This represents performance. The higher you are up the shaft, the, the higher the performance, right? Inside that shaft is a box. That box basically is what make you go higher up the performance. So you sitting right here basically, right? And so this is the box that is gonna go, that is gonna make you go higher. Inside that box, to make, so the box, I'm going to come back to it because it's very important. But in order for that box to go up, we need to put whatever, hot air inside, pressure, it doesn't matter, I'll explain. So that pressure is going to be this circle right there. Right? So right away you see that. 
if you put too much pressure for the box, it won't work. Or let's say hot air. The hot air with, will spread everywhere. The, uh, the shaft will become hotter, but the box won't. You cannot raise your performance. Okay, so this is the idea of critical mass, is to keep the pressure always inside the box. You know that from pushing, like you can only apply stress to the point where the body can recover from it. This is the concept of critical mass. So what interests us, again, I will go into depth more uh, in seminars and things like that. I'm just trying to get you uh, like a resume of it so we, we can move forward. The, so we have the box, which is what really interests us the most right there. The pressure inside the box, that circle, that's hormesis. What is hormesis? It's called stress response hormesis, which is a very fancy way of saying favorable response to stress. Okay, so what that would does not kill you makes you stronger. Okay, that is programming, really. We're still going to stress the body and we're going to elicit a response out of it. So now, and here comes the conundrum, right? Is how can I stress the body more in order to get the performance higher? but not go outside the box. And that is the problem, is if you stress the body too much, you break down, performance goes down, right? So everything is about this box. The bigger I can make this box, the more stress I can put in it, the higher the box goes, the higher the performance, right? So we always go down to that box. What is that box? That box is, has four corners, right? One, two, three, four. And those are the corners I talked about in the podcast all the time. The first corners is what is a human movement? That's the load, the hold, and the carry. First corner. Second corner, all the planes of movement. Right? Sagittal, frontal, median. This is all energy. Third corner is all energy systems. Fourth corner is all types of contraction. Right? Eccentric, isometric, concentric. Energy system. You, you guys know all this. Google it. It's not that hard to find. Right? So... The key with critical mass is, is to put enough stress within the box to make the shaft go up. And that is where you see most problems is if the programming is too hard on the body, the, home, the, the circle exceeds the square, things break, performance goes down, right? So um, I refer always to coaches that, that do the programming as circle. I'm a square. My job is not to stress, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I'm part of a square in the sense like when I train for strongmen or if I have athletes that I, I need to help with their performance, I will stress them out out there and everything. But mostly I'm a square. My job is to balance the athletes in order to make that box bigger. If I develop those two corners, let's say three, too much, but not this one, the box is in balance, it's going to go sideways, pick up steam. When it hits the size of the shaft, injury happen. Okay, so my job really is to balance athletes. So I'm a square versus a circle. So again, this is what is a movement, load, carry, or hold, uh, plans of movement, energy system, types of contraction. Okay, so this matters a lot, why? So now, if I wanna apply that to only lifting, right? How do I apply that system to lifting? So I'm gonna look at the sports of only lifting and I'm gonna look toward first corner, what is a movement? Okay, so a load, a hold, or a carry. Well, Olympic lifting is all load, right? You don't hold the weight uh, and you certainly don't carry it. So right away, we already have the start of an imbalance there. After that, we go toward the planes of movement, right? Olympic lifting, there's another problem there. It's all in the sagittal plane, up and down. That's all we get, right? Energy system, it's mostly to our strength. It's max three reps. So again, we're in balance in that. And after all types of contraction, uh, if you look at Olympic weightlifting, it's mostly concentric, right? You try to eliminate the eccentric as much as possible in order to be able to do more work. That's great, but now it's another imbalance. So now you're in balance on all four corners of the box. So you'll see a lot of injuries because of that. So the key for Olympic weightlifting is to, it's gonna be to fix all this. So the first is a load of carry and a hold, right? So you have so much load, you're gonna have to do some balancing there by carrying, for example, a sandbag, things like this. And uh, after you go to planes of movement, everything in the sagittal plane. Okay, so just like CrossFit. So what do you see from there? You have no pull in the frontal plane. So that will limit the action of your lats. So your lats will become weaker. Your rear delt, rear delt will become a problem. Uh, after that, we have like no median. So left versus right, right? No medium plane, uh, no torque. So that means usually very little oblique. The only exercise for obliques really in, the, in Olympic weightlifting is the split jerk. 
right? Because you have one leg in front. So it actually, it's a little bit of the medium plane. The problem is it only works one oblique in an entire rotational way, which is my favorite actually, but you only work one oblique, right? An energy system, obviously, uh, most only lifters are there are not really in great shape. So uh, that will be an issue too, because it will limit the amount of work you can do without stressing the soft tissue and the body too much. Then after that, we go toward types of contraction. That's another problem because there's no eccentric, right? So when you go all, all uh, concentric on the same movement, you end up with uh, a limited range of motion in the sense of uh, range of motion under tension. There's a lot of people that can be very flexible. For example, doing the split does not guarantee you that you can uh, do a sumo deadlift correctly without your knees coming in. So I'm not talking about obviously the top Olympic. Well, everybody is gonna is gonna use the Chinese or people like that as as an example uh, for Olympic weightlifters. I'm talking about the vast majority, right? In order to be successful at Olympic weightlifting, you have to have range of motion of your lats, uh, of the bicep tendon, and things like that. And the lack of the lack of eccentric actually has something to do with this. So, uh, what do I see in Olympic weightlifters? The big problem is I see the lats first. Right. So I trained some Olympic weightlifters and you see an entire right side, which is the, the weak side, starting to collapse. So you see a problem with the lat and you see a problem with the rear delt. You see because there's no holding overhead every time the weight is up, you guys drop it right away. You see uh, the load trap is not developed enough. So that will result whenever you. So you have the lats that are not being worked properly and the load trap that is not worked enough to stabilize overhead. So that means usually you'll see Olympic weightlifters catching, especially on, on the snatch, shrugging. Why? Because you cannot use your lats to stabilize the, the, the movement. Your lats are not strong enough, your load trap is not strong enough. If you cannot use your lats, you're gonna have to go to the se se second, uh, sorry, um, second strongest muscle group next to it, which is the traps. So that's why you're trying to shrug it's because you cannot receive using your lats properly that will make you go to your traps, okay? So to compensate for that, we're gonna have to develop the lats, the rear delt and the low trap. So the low trap means my favorite overhead yoke carry. Again, we go back to that, which is a carry. So it balances, it balances the box anyway. The lats, the rows, one arm rows, medium plane and frontal plane, that's perfect. Uh, bent over rows, all that stuff again, Figure this out, this is for you. Um, and then after all the eccentric and everything, this is what I have the openers for, okay? Uh, you guys have seen on my YouTube channel, I have the bicep opener, the tricep opener, which is really a lat opener. What I want is I want range of motion under tension. Certain parts of your body have to be able to have full range of motion under heavy load, which is the key. You can do as much passive stretching as you, as you, as you want. The second you're gonna put that max weight overhead, you're gonna go back to your original range of motion, which is short. So what does that mean on the snatch? It means you cannot open the lat here, so you're gonna have to default by turning the shoulder in, right? Because you're gonna have to go here. You cannot keep the lat opening enough. It's gonna be short, so in order to go, since you cannot open the lat anymore, you're gonna have to turn in order to go to the pec. So now the pec minor is getting, is getting stretched and everything, and that's why you see that internal rotation, and that makes you go toward the trap, and now the entire system is coming toward the inside. Top of it, everything you do in Olympic weightlifting is pronated. There's no supination. So again, we go back to internally rotating the shoulder all the time. So of course you end up doing this on the snatch all the time and you miss the snatch forward, right? So the key again is lats. There is uh, something I call the S pyramid. This is a lot of stuff, but this is a video so you can go back to it. I call that the S pyramid. Let me go there. Here. The first part is structure. Stabil so this is structure. This is stabilization. This is specialization. Uh, I use specialization because I needed a, a word that starts with S. So that's the S pyramid. Structure first, stabilization second specialization third. So if you think about that, imagine as a squat. If you can't hold the weight on your back, you're not gonna squat it. Sounds obvious, right? But a lot of time, people squat heavy weights that really their T-spine cannot, cannot handle very well, and so they end up in, in a weird position and that screws up their squat entirely. You're at the bottom. You cannot come up, you cannot stabilize the weight. That means you're gonna start squatting sideways. Not a good thing either, right? So if you have the structure to handle the weight, you have the bottom, you have the stabilization to come just straight up, 
then the, sp the movement specialization become easier. So structure for Olympic weightlifters goes through the obliques a lot. And so if the oblique is underdeveloped, which is usually on one side because of the split jerk, the lat has nothing to anchor on, right? So the lat will collapse. So once the lat collapse, here goes all the pressure on the shoulder, the shoulder collapse, puts it on the traps, and then that's what you see, uh, the snatch being slightly uneven and everything, is there is nothing to anchor the lat. So once you have a bad shoulder and the lat is off, we're gonna have to look at the oblique. So I need to rebuild the shoulder sometimes, rebuild the lat, and then really the structure, which is the oblique. I will have to go toward the oblique, rebuild the lat, rebuild the shoulder, but it goes through the oblique. If you have problem on the oblique, especially on one side, that will lead to massive problem for your lat, that will lead to massive problem with your shoulder. So that's why sometimes a lot of people try to just fix their shoulders. By the way, it goes for CrossFit as well. And that will not work, okay? Because you're not fixing really the key log of the problem, which in that case, your oblique is not strong enough to handle the weight you want to put overhead. So the, stru the structure collapses. Here comes the lat. Oblique, lat, shoulder, and now you're, you're crooked and you put tremendous pressure on this shoulder. So of course now you're, you're going to have to do something funky on the other shoulder to stabilize and to compensate for it. And the entire structure will break down. Okay, so it's uh, not something we want. But that's the problem a little bit is once your, sh your shoulder hurts, even if it's you know, on the weak side, then you're going to go to a PT, he's going to fix it, you're going to come back. You haven't fixed the problem. The oblique and the lat are still not firing. So you will keep going back through the same issue again and again and again and again. And so, sorry, until you fix the structure, the problem will not change, okay? So we go back every time to, to this, but you have to balance the body. Remember, you cannot put, uh, uh, remember the, the circle within the box. The circle cannot exceed the box, okay? So you cannot put stress to the point where your body cannot handle it. I know it sounds obvious when I say it like this, but usually people don't really, Look at it, they will go like, yeah, no, I'm just gonna push and then we'll see what happens. No, I know what happens, you get hurt. And so that doesn't mean you get, big injuries are still, uh, obviously we don't avoid that, but the small injuries are still not, not good either. I want, again, I go back to that thing all the time, but when you wake up in pain in the morning, those are small injuries toward the soft tissue, that is not acceptable. You have to just balance the body and the, the damage on the soft tissue will start to, to go away. Uh, this is how I limit really the training of my athletes is based on the damage on the soft tissue. Some exercises stress the soft tissue more than others. So that's how actually our program is based on that. But uh, the key is going back to that box right here is the circle cannot exceed the, the box. That's the point, okay? And so look to our making the box bigger first before you increase the stress, okay? The four corners, you have to increase. Have questions? Uh, about CrossFit, about the, a lot of time, I see that a lot in CrossFit now, it's a lot of shoulder problems. Uh, I think we're gonna start to see bicep tendons also frailing, like uh, tearing from the long head. But right now, a lot of the questions are about the shoulder. We have the same problem with CrossFit as we do with Olympic weightlifting. Is, I mean, um, the box is more balanced in CrossFit in the sense of uh, all the energy systems are being used. Um, the contraction though is mostly concentric in CrossFit, like the weight is being dropped all the time, there's very little eccentric, creates its own set of problems. The movement, there is some movement now in CrossFit and more and more people are using farmer's carries, types of carries, I'm very happy about that. Uh, the, the planes of movement, they are a bit more, it's more balanced than in Olympic weightlifting, but you still see the same problem, there's no pull in the frontal plane, so again, the, the lats are not being activated properly. And, uh, and, the eccentric is very, uh, it's a very important thing. Like you'll see a lot of time range of motion under, uh, sorry, range of motion under tension goes through the eccentric phase. You need the eccentric in order to get the muscle to work to the full range of motion. Concentric, especially with something that is ballistic as CrossFit where the movements go fast, allows you to float at first and then engage. And so you never truly work the muscle in, in the full range of, of, of motion going back under tension every time. So the eccentric is a very important part of movement. You can actually load the muscle more in eccentric, but uh, the, the way I make people work the eccentric is through the openers that I created, right? The bicep opener, the lat opener, I mean, sorry, the tricep opener, which is also a lat opener, the shoulder and the chest opener. I use uh, the openers in order to get full range of motion under tension, which is again, uh, I do that as a warm-up, but it's mostly to balance the box, right? It's to make sure, make sure that the muscle 
that are being used are finally being used under their full range of motion. So I see that on the bicep opener a lot. Think back lever, right? So I want the bicep to work fully stretched from here, the shoulder is stretching, and then I open completely here, right? This is a full range of motion of the bicep, not just this, right? Stretch this way, go all the way there and back. That's the full range of motion of the bicep. So what happens when you don't have full range of motion? Um, again, under tension. I'm not talking about passive stretching. It's something else entirely. When I cannot achieve under heavy load, under heavy tension, that full range of motion, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to find another way around, right? Which means usually means I'm gonna rotate the elbow this way in order to stretch the chest instead of instead of the bicep, right? So here, I'm going to turn this way. You'll see that a lot on the muscle ups. And then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to default to my trap, right? So instead, again, of engaging the lat here, stretching the bicep, engaging the lat, I'm going to have to default to my chest and to my trap. So now suddenly the stress becomes here tremendous. So we, again, instead of being able to use the lat, we go back to pick minor, into the trap. So you'll see that for CrossFit a lot on muscle ups. When people are here, first of all, they start to open out because they cannot keep the tension on the bicep tendon because it doesn't have the full range of motion. So they will open. You'll see a lot of people coming here instead of staying there. That's actually not a shoulder problem, it's a bicep problem. And then after that, if they cannot keep the position here, instead of using their lats, they'll default to their traps. And so again, like everything else in CrossFit is gonna you know, they develop the, it's the, the high trap syndrome. I mean, it's going to jack your traps and everything. So by having a short range of motion on your bicep, you will stress the chest and the traps too much uh, on, on a lot of CrossFit movements, especially muscle ups, but others as well. And so everything in CrossFit really feeds the upper trap, right? So uh, if the, the, the lack of planes of movement because of the choice of exercises in CrossFit, you are very likely to not engage your lats correctly and to uh, jack your traps all the time and to go toward a lot of stress on the pec minor, which gives even more shoulder problem and things like that. So this is why I created the openers, where so you can get full range of motion on certain muscles that are very important. So the bicep is a big one for the shoulder. Then the, obviously, the, if you cannot achieve proper position overhead because your lats, again, don't have a correct range of motion, You'll, you'll find a way around, which in that case is internal rotation of the shoulder and then you'll sh stress again the traps, the pec. So we go back to the same problem again and again and again and again. So of course there's so much problem uh, for the shoulder in CrossFit because everything you do is internal rotation and defaulting to the trap. So everything goes like this. And so that's what you see all this area getting so much problem and then the neck issues and all that stuff happening. So the key to fix this really is to balance the athlete. It's not about treating the traps, not about treating the shoulder. It's just, you know, get a bigger box, balance the athletes. The openers that I created, I'll put them out there on the YouTube channel, are designed for that in order to, to gain range of motion on the lat, on the bicep, on the shoulder, in all those positions. Once you can achieve decent amount of weight, again, the openers are not about the weight, it's about quality, but once you can achieve decent weights on this and you achieve good range of motion, you'll see that a lot of those problems will magically just go away. Okay, so th that was, uh, again, it's the, um, the problem in CrossFit are the same Olympic weightlifting because the plane of movements are the same, right? It's, it's the same thing. It's not, I don't have to treat the shoulder for CrossFitters. I just balance the box and then everything falls into place, right? Okay, so uh, another set of questions that I had was about people being quite dominant, right? And uh, the, all the problem it causes with the knee, things like that. So uh, lower body was you have two type of movement, two types of movement, sorry, which is squat and the hinge. In CrossFit, a lot of the, t uh, a lot of the, the time people think the hinge when they really, they, they don't, they mostly squat, they just find a way to turn a hinge into a squat. And uh, because of the lack of eccentric and then the ballistic nature, you know, like the nature of CrossFit, which is about moving very fast, there's very actually little uh, hammies engagement. The, the, I've talked about that in the blog, but mu the muscles all have different, uh, you know, uh, functions. Evolution got us here over a long period of time. And certain muscles are more designed for concentric than they are for eccentric and vice versa. Okay, so every muscle group has really a function is better designed for. And the hammies is mostly stabilization. Like you can flex the hammy, the concentric part, 
but that's not really the, the main purpose. The main purpose, look at a sprint, for example, is when the foot touches, it's all at eccentric and stabilization of the movement. And so um, there's not enough posterior chain engagement in CrossFit in the sense of everything is turning into a squat. Uh, very little hinging. So that they've developed the, the quads, everything, the glutes to a degree, but n not the hammies enough. So a lot of time, uh, especially women have a tendency to be more quad dominant to start with. So that and the lack of uh, hammies activation will uh, create a tremendous amount of torque on the hip and everything which will misalign the, the femur and the tibula which in case will, will create knee issues and things like that. So we need more posterior chain engagement, especially hammies engagement for uh, CrossFit and to a degree for Olympic weightlifting as, as well. So the way I like it to do, uh, to do it the most is go back to the function first of the hammy, which is, uh, for example, the sprint. So that's why I like putting uh, people on parallel sprint so much. It's because by the end of it, you will feel your hammies and your ass will be on fire. CrossFit have actually a weakness on that. I like to program a lot of um, very, very hard sprints where you go full max, you have a minute break and then you come back and by four or five sprints, most, most of them will give up. The key there is the, that's the best way that I, uh, that I know how to start to involve the posterior chain is to use the parallel sprints. It's a great exercise. After that, I'll go to an isolation like the one arm deadlift, things like that. But the idea for crossfitters is to learn to hinge properly. It is a bigger problem than most people think. A lot of time when I test people on the one arm deadlift, they want to squat, not hinge. So the key is you want the other crossfitters, either, uh, when I make them do a hinge, right, they don't turn their hips, they don't pivot their hips on the side like this. They, they either try to squat down or they flex and extend their spine. So that's the two movements you'll see in CrossFit is either a squat or flexion or extension of the spine. You don't see a hinge. People manage to squat the first part and then extend their spine, so engaging their erectors for the second part, right? So they found a way to, uh, to avoid the hinge to go straight to a squat. And so people that are quad dominant to start with will have tendency to do that more and then so that further the problem down the line. So the, the key really to fix most of those issues is to learn to hinge correctly, okay? So stiff leg, all this, all the sixes are great, but remember the point is not to flex the spine, uh, to flex the erectors, right? It's not flexion extension of the spine. It's hinging at the hip, right? Not a squat, not an extension of the spine. It's learning to hinge properly. I have different exercise that I use for this, but the parallel sprints is so easy. It's a very little skill involved and you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to press and you're gonna have to hinge. If you try to squat on a parallel sprint, you'll notice because people turn their feet out. It's because they can't engage the, the hammy the way it's supposed to and then the, and activate the glute properly so they'll try to turn their foot in order to push off of their foot in order to turn the movement into a squat. So as a coach it's very easy to spot. Make people do parallel sprints until they get tired and you'll see that uh, one side will give, usually the weak side will give up first right and you'll see them turning their foot, their heel will turn in in order to turn what should be a hinge into a squat. So parallel sprints are easy, and then, but that as a coach or even as an athlete on you, they will tell you right away you have a problem with hinging. And so you're gonna have to learn that skill again. It is a much bigger problem than it sounds. Uh, again, um, and that's that especially in CrossFit. Look at people hinging, and you'll notice they mostly squat and flexion extension of the, sp of the spine. They don't hinge. And so that's why you see the posterior chain not being engaged enough in CrossFit, right? So everything is turning into uh, it's turning CrossFit into a quite dominant sport. Okay, so those, I mean, I have way more questions, but uh, this will be enough for today. And then I'll try to answer some of the stuff on the blog, but I'll try to do this video once a week and then probably, you know, 20, 30 minutes and go over all the questions that I got because I'm guessing I'm going to get more and more and more and I'll try to get to as much as I can. But again, remember, I will try to tell you how to do things, not what to do. Okay, burn the questions and I'll see you soon.